Wonderful. So thank you all for coming to another session for our Social Studies Summer Seminar Series. My name is Linda Burroughs and I'm the Director for K-12 Social Studies and World and Native Languages here at the Department of Education. And today we have a very special guest from the OER project uh, who Iman and Megan are going to share with us the story of knowledge, which is a part two series. So hopefully you signed up for tomorrow's session as well. And it's on diversifying and contextualizing knowledge. So with that, I'm going to turn the session over to them. I will be um, here if you need anything, type whatever you need in the chat. I will be coming back on at the end of the session to ask you to put your first and last names into the chat for me to double check attendance at that point in time. But with that, I want to um, let Iman and Megan introduce themselves and thank you so much for coming. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. Um, my name is Iman El Sheikh and I'm a member of the OER project team. I'm also a doctoral student at the University of Chicago where I study the history and anthropology of science and knowledge. And I'm really passionate about the history of uh, how our knowledge and our collective learning changes over time and all the different people involved in that process, including yourselves. And I'm always on the lookout for interesting stories about this. So today we'll talk about how the history of science or knowledge, which I'll explain in a minute a little bit more broadly, um, and I'm calling them stories of knowledge here uh, to expand beyond just the natural sciences, um, can be explored in your own classrooms in an inclusive and rich manner, which brings in a whole lot of different narratives and perspectives. Um, so, to get us started, I would love to do a round of introductions, but since we have a lovely big group here, um, I think it will be best to use the chat function um, at this stage, although we will be doing some breakout rooms a little bit later. Um, but in the chat, what I'd like us to do is to introduce ourselves with, you know, your name, your school, what you teach, um, but also to get us started on this theme, share a story about knowledge from your curriculum and i know folks are teaching all kinds of different things here so you know an idea something that was discovered or invented what people are involved or in some cases there are no people involved and we don't really know who is attached to a particular discovery or idea or invention and from what you know when and where did this happen so we'll just take a few minutes if you need to think, um, but pop it in the chat, let us know who you are and that way we can get a sense of, of who's here and the diverse kinds of teachers and the diverse stories of knowledge we already have. And I'll be uh, monitoring the chat and highlighting a couple that we can um, talk about. Oh, cool. We have Ginny teaching theory of knowledge. That's that sounds great. I'm sure we'll have some interesting things to hear from you. And we have lots of social studies teachers, humanities, art, um, a lot of English. These are all really great um, places to talk about stories of knowledge. Um, Spencer mentions the Industrial Revolution and westward expansion. Those are really fantastic places to feature stories of knowledge. Mercedes says that in sixth grade, it's all about humans discovering new things and inventing things to make lives better and easier. So that is going to be such a great fit. I'm looking forward to hearing about the stories of knowledge in your classroom throughout this series of talks. I mean, it's exciting that you devote a year to it, Mercedes, because, you know, um, in some ways, because I study this, I see stories of knowledge everywhere. So it'll be really exciting to find that. Oh, Jeffrey teaches marketing and personal finance. That's a really interesting place also to talk about stories of knowledge. There's so many things that we take for granted, like checks or credit um, are ideas that had their origin somewhere as well. Um, Lori says that 
knowledge is not power unless applied to new and novel situations. That's really fascinating point, Lori, because oftentimes we don't classify certain things as knowledge because they haven't become institutionalized in certain ways, but it's very interesting to trace an idea and see how it travels from an idea to becoming, you know, uh, tied to power, tied to the state or tied to institutions. Um, so that's really cool uh, perspective to think about there. And a lot of the things that we think of as, um, you know, very serious knowledge, like, you know, for example, surgery and surgical techniques, um, just at the turn of the, you know, the 19th century and, and uh, sorry, as we transition to the 20th century, we're still kind of sketchy and people didn't really know how to think about them. Diane mentions the Holocaust from a boy's perspective. You know, in these kinds of topics, it might be hard to imagine a kind of knowledge, but both from the perspective of studies like genocide studies, the idea of some of, of violence, um, but also the ideas that science had a role in a lot of movements like that, like eugenics. So those are interesting ways to think about stories of knowledge that may not always be ones that we think of in a positive way. Um, Dana says the history of astronomy that can be connected with today. I think you're, you'll, you'll like this, um, this talk today, Dana, we talk quite a bit about astronomy and that's a really great one because you can see conversations across time. Uh, Tiffany mentions different irrigation techniques in ancient times. Um, that's a fantastic one. You know, we can really trace farming technologies and, and agricultural technologies from ancient times to present times from, you know, the first person who, you know, notice that planting a seed to irrigation, as Tiffany mentioned, and, and Rose as well, um, to the building of cities uh, for making cities livable, places livable, as Rose said, to now, you know, um, fertilizer techniques and, and um, genetic engineering of seeds. So what I hope we're all starting to see is that knowledge is everywhere, stories of knowledge are everywhere. Um, Shannon mentions the Enlightenment, natural light rights, law, um, John Locke, foundations of American government. This is an excellent one that people often overlook. Um, political science, government, governance, um, all of social studies is a, a fountain of places to talk about knowledge. Who had the first idea for democracy or how many different ways people think about democracy or freedom or rights and how has that changed over time? Um, wonderful. So we've, we've got our, our ideas going. Um, so I'm really excited to, to jump in. Um, and we'll start in a in sort of strange place. If you all have more ideas that you'd like to add, feel free to jump, uh, jump in. Uh, let's look at Sarah's really quickly. Um, achievements and discoveries in the Americas pre-Columbus, the Islamic golden age, protecting and translating knowledge from ancient Greece and Rome and adding to it China as well. That's fantastic, Sarah. And I think that those are all things that will fit really nicely into our talk today. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very interesting also to speak to you all as a group of teachers and educators, because educators are all involved in stories of knowledge by definition. And so, um, you know, your own story is a really interesting one to add here. So to get started, um, as you know, as you saw, there are so many stories we tell about knowledge and as diverse as they might seem, they can often be pretty limited from our students' perspective. Um, students have a lot of misconceptions about who the knowledge makers are in society. So you've all listed such diverse ideas about knowledge and where it comes from and even what we think of as knowledge. Um, but students don't always have this really full picture. So take, for example, the Draw a Scientist study, which was initiated in 1983 by David Wade Ch Chambers and continues to be revisited and restaged today. And basically, in this study, students were asked to draw a scientist. And the vast majority drew sort of the mad scientist in a lab. You know, these are kids drawing, so they're a little bit hard to parse, but they were usually like white men with sort of crazy hair. Um, very few girls drew female scientists, but even then only a minority. Um, scientists of color were virtually non-existent. But the reality is that knowledge making is really diverse. Uh, the kinds of knowledge we make are diverse. They're not all made in a lab with speakers and chemicals. The people who make knowledge are diverse and we make that knowledge in diverse ways as well. Um, and I believe it's very important for students to see many different kinds of people involved in that process, not just the lone genius, but also the collaborators and the teachers and the synthesizers. 
um, the people who are responsible for spreading knowledge and educating and um, making sure it's available to people who have different levels of understanding of it. And I, I believe this is important because it allows students to see themselves as potential knowledge makers. So the goal is to really help students learn about the diversity of knowledge, but also the context of knowledge in order to see themselves in it and to see their teachers in it and to feel like they participate in it. And social studies classrooms are a really excellent place to do this, but as are general humanities, science, and even math courses. And I hope that what we talk about today will give you some ideas for that. So how do we help students understand the diversity of knowledge and concepts? The first thing is diversifying and contextualizing. And diversifying is, as I said, not just in terms of representation, but in terms of what counts as knowledge and really having that kind of conversation. Um, what kinds of people are involved in making that knowledge from everyone from a lab technician to the theorist who's writing the mathematical concepts to the teacher, to the textbook writer, and to the students themselves who are asking questions and refining the process. And that connects right to contextualizing, really thinking about the context. So often we think about ideas and science as these sort of eureka moments that happen out of nowhere. But as we all know, they come from somewhere, they go somewhere. And as these ideas travel and move from person to person, um, they really do transform and that story is worth telling. Then we also have collective learning. Um, for those of you who are familiar with um, the Big History Project from the OER Project, collective learning is defined as hum humanity's unique ability to share, preserve, and build upon knowledge. And I think this is a really, really fantastic concept for students to mobilize in the classroom because it can be used everywhere from a science classroom to an English classroom to a social studies classroom to think about how as humans we're constantly building upon what we inherit we're changing it we're adapting it and that creates the culture and the community that we have. Um, and the last point here is evaluating narratives. And this is something we'll focus on a bit more in our session tomorrow, but I do want to touch on it here. But since we know students have a limited understanding about knowledge, we need them to unpack and evaluate narratives about knowledge as singular and knowledge about um, and ideas that there's a particular type of person who makes uh, knowledge. So while we're seeing improvements in the draw scientist tests in recent years, there's still a lot to be done. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit more about this approach, but what I want us to do is to jump into a case study. And this case study is from some materials that myself and some of my colleagues have developed at the OER project. Um, and it is a series of articles um, based on scientists and thinkers from the Islamic golden age. Um, so what I'd like us to do is to read uh, one of these articles, which is the opening article. It's a six article series and it's written by myself and my colleagues. And what I'd like us to do is to read through it and take a few minutes to um, familiarize ourselves with it and answer these two questions. Um, does this article diversify and contextualize narratives about knowledge? How? And does it illustrate the concept of collective learning? Um, so this is a short article. Um, what I'd like to do is to set aside about 10 minutes to read it. Uh, we also have an audio version available if you would like to listen to it being read. Um, and keep these two questions in mind. And the reason I want to offer a case study is that it allows us to talk um, more concretely about what this looks like in practice, rather than speak about it abstractly. And it will set us up to look at the other articles in this series and set us up for our activity tomorrow as well. Um, so let's set aside 10 minutes. Um, I believe there should be a link in the chat. Yes, thank you, Megan. Uh, Megan has linked us to um, all of the articles. Uh, you should be able to click on this one, which is called Standing on the Shoulders of Invisible Giants. Um, where you can also access the audio version of it. And if you have any questions about accessing any of this, please do ask questions in the chat. Um, and I'm here if you have questions in the next 10 minutes. Um, but essentially this introduction helps us think about the history of science as a history of collective learning. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what you all think and to chat about it a little bit more. Um, so it's now 11, it's now uh, 15 after, so let's come back at 25 after. But again, I'm still here. If you have any questions, please do feel free to jump in.
All right. Um, let me know if you need a couple more minutes, but um, if not, we can jump into the discussion here. Um, so this article is the first in the series, and it's not focused on a specific idea or a specific person, but rather on the concept of collective learning and um, sort of the metaphor of standing on the shoulders of giants um, and the added metaphor of invisible giants. Um, so what I'd like us to do is to just kind of talk through it and to get a little bit warmed up with this case study, which we'll dive deeper into in the next, uh, in a few, next few minutes. Um, but what I'd like to know is um, if you all think this article helps diversify and contextualize narratives about knowledge and, and how so, and um, if the article illustrates the concept of collective learning. Um, so you can participate in two ways. One, you can use the raise hand feature and use your mic to just um, jump in, we'll call on folks. Um, you may also use the chat feature, um, but feel free to turn on your camera if you feel comfortable knowing that it's still being recorded. Um, but if you'd like to just turn on your mic to jump in, please raise your hand or um, pop it in the chat if, um, if you have an answer to one of these two questions or to both. So the first question is, um, how does this article diversify and contextualize narratives about knowledge? And the second one is, how does this article illustrate the concept of collective learning? And I should say that I'm also talking about the, um, the images in the article, not just the text, because we had a wonderful set of artists work on these um, as well. Um, so SD Grow, sorry if, if your name uh, is, is something else, please feel free to let me know and I will refer to it that way, um, says it definitely shows collective learning by showing how people learn from one another and how they learn from different parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it kind of puts collective learning on kind of a interpersonal level. It shows that there's people involved in, in knowledge, but also um, it kind of places a map there for us to think across how ideas travel. And I, I like to think about um, ideas or concept as having a kind of itinerary. You know, they stop here, they go there. Um, Rainey says it illustrates the collective learning by explaining how different cultures have contributed over the centuries. Yes, absolutely. Um, so many ideas that we have are very multicultural and have been slightly changed everywhere they've gone um, and cultures have put their own spin on them. And I really don't believe that cultures really ever borrow from one another because every time an idea goes to somewhere else, it actually transforms. Things are not applied exactly as is. Um, they change to fit the context. Uh, Mercedes says it diversifies because it gives a voice to people and cultures that were left out of the traditional narrative of history and gives context of how folks like Copernicus um, and other well-named uh, named scientists have built off of one another. Yes, so you know it shows that we might have this like particular figure, but behind that figure, there's a whole bunch of other people um, from different places. Um, we also contextualize period-wise, as, as Spencer says, we move back from before the scientific revolution. Um, Betsy uh, points out that it shows learning as a process and a chain and learning. And, and absolutely, that's, that's what we were trying to do is to create this dynamic understanding of knowledge. It's not just this, aha, you know, it's, it, it moves through time and, and, and space. Um, Connie points out that there's so many contributions. I like the phrase you put there, Connie treasure trove of contributions. It's not a one person show. Absolutely, it's a multi-person, multicultural, multi-time period show. Um, Shannon points out the power of ideas and how they evolve and influence other ideas. Yes, I think evolution is a great way to look at this. Um, ideas evolve and you know we talk about the progress of knowledge, but things are also sometimes forgotten and they come back later. Um, I'm sure you all have noticed you know, folks talking about things like the Paleolithic diet and, and people are then trying to remember you know, old ideas we had about how we should eat. Um, and if we think of diet as a technology, we can really start thinking about um, the different ways that different cultures have evolved the way that they um, have a cuisine to, to keep themselves healthy. Um, Shoni points out um, Newton's discovery of gravity was actually, you know, um, a much bigger context. And uh, it's more realistic that, and, and you know, if you tell a student that if you want to be a scientist, you have to be an, a Newton who just has an epiphany one day, that, that can be discouraging. Um, but a lot of other fuller pictures of knowledge have space for students to grow into. Uh, Rose points out the diversification aspect shows the global nature of learning and knowledge. 
um, and contextualizing shows uh, that people can connect to it on a personal or family level. Absolutely. Um, you know, we all have our own family knowledge and our own community knowledge of what to eat, how to build, how to run a business, how to um, manage, you know, inclement weather. And those little bits of knowledge can start on a very local level and like link up. Oh, we have a hand raised. Um, Dana, feel free to jump in. Uh, sorry, my voice is a little gravelly. No, one of the things that I was thinking about reading through it is, um, you know, uh, the collective learning portion of it when, you know, it, Islam, as it we teach in social studies, that it travels throughout, you know, the European countries and all of that thing. We don't really talk about the fact that they brought algebra and they brought, you know, all these other mathematical uh, ideas and formulas. And that's how they were, you know, they didn't just bring a, a religious culture, they brought all those scientific thoughts. And then, um, so that kind of, I guess it just kind of flows into both of it, you know, that diversifying, contextualizing those narratives, we don't really talk about you know, the extras that um, different cultures brought as they traveled through and migrated and all of those things. Yeah, that's such a fantastic <laughs> point. All right, do you have anything else to add, Dana? <laughs> nope, that should be it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Um, yes, absolutely. And, you know, um, what we talk a lot in at least world history courses and, and civics courses about the spread of belief systems and in many ways, religious ideas can are, are ideas, right? And they have their own kinds of knowledge, including even medical knowledge and healing practices. Um, but as you said, they bring ideas like math and uh, ideas like chemistry. And um, these travel with people, but they also travel with um, books. And they also, when, when books become a thing and, and parchment um, and people memorizing texts and relaying them orally. So that there's also an interesting question about how an idea gets from one place to another. Um, and, uh, you know, Enrique points out that, you know, there are different cultures that are not typically talked about in history books that have contributed deep knowledge to, to build on Dana's point as well. This idea that um, we often, talk about certain cultures as contributing certain things, but we don't always talk about the knowledge that they have contributed. Um, and, and Alvin points out there's a lot of value of learning from one another and valuing other cultures. And, and I absolutely agree. And that's one of the reasons I really like studying the history of science and knowledge. I feel like it forces us to be global in a certain way. Um, uh, T Mills also says we don't often hear about the the, the shoulders that people stand on. Um, and that's a really great reminder. I'm sure you all remember, um, you know, teachers that really you were able to stand on their shoulders and and become so much bigger than you would have been on your own. And um, these are important reminders as well, because sometimes well, often those people are not in the history books. Um, Laverne points out how Arabic served as um, a basis of exchange and understanding and how cultures might have shared bridges across geography. Um, yeah, absolutely. Arabic was a lingua franca or a very you know, widely spoken language uh, throughout time period. So even if it wasn't your native language and there were many other native languages, Arabic became sort of the, the scientific language. And we can think of other languages like Latin doing the same thing, um, Spanish doing the same thing in South America and all these different contexts to think about, um, and now English has become sort of this scientific language and what languages um, help us do and, and how sharing a language helps us share ideas. Um, Naomi also points out that we build our knowledge off of others' discoveries. Um, and, you know, in, in her classroom, um, it's important to teach students about things that we may have never heard of, but that still really influence us. And, you know, if we just look at our own classrooms, the number of tools and, and, and objects we have, they, each of them has a really cool history um, that we've probably never heard of. Um, Let's see, giving credit, John points out and showing that we can appreciate different aspects. Credit's an important idea. It also helps students um, see themselves as um, capable because students themselves come from different um, cultures. And Laverne talks about um, using a bibliography as a way for showing that knowledge comes from somewhere. And you know, we all ask students to cite their sources. So bibliography is giving credit is really important. 
Um, Scott points out that this helps us move beyond a Western viewpoint. Um, absolutely. And Sarah points out how little citation work was done. So I'm sure all of you, whether you teach English or social studies or humanities are really focused on citations, bibliographies, giving credit, references. Um, and a lot of these scientists in the medieval period, you know, didn't have that technology. So the citation is a technology um, that we think of as something very obvious, but that's something that at some point folks started to think was a good practice. And of course, as we know, there's many different practices of citation currently. Um, and Rose points out we're in it together as a human race. Um, and it, that's so true because it's very hard oftentimes to contain knowledge. You know, we have systems now about intellectual property and patent laws and, in, and you know, those themselves are an idea, um, but they always fail. They always leak and ideas get out. It's, it's very hard to keep things like that contained. Um, but then it's also, uh, you know, possible to keep certain kinds of knowledge proprietary. And that's a really interesting point as well. So, you know, this is a great group. We've had such a great conversation, so I'm excited to continue it. So um, what I'd like to talk about next is to kind of move a little bit back into your classrooms before we dive deeper into this case study, because I'd like to gather a little bit more specific information about the classrooms that you teach in and what students are already knowledgeable about what gaps they have. So now we've got an impression of how, you know, we might expand our story of knowledge and I want to connect it to our classrooms and breakout rooms to give folks a bit more chance to grapple with the questions and discuss. So what I'd like us to do in the breakout rooms is to talk about in your classroom, what stats, you know, what giants do students already recognize, you know, who are the familiar people and, you know, depending on what class you teach, it'll be quite different, right? So if you teach, um, you know, a US history class, folks might know a lot about Thomas Jefferson, or they might know about, um, you know, the Magna Carta or the, or John Locke, um, or they might look, know about like Eli Whitney and, and, or about the cotton gin. Um, but if you teach a world history class, you might focus on things like the advent of writing. And some of those have giants associated with them, and some of them don't have a person associated with them. So it would be interesting to think about which giants appear in your class as sort of the big names and which ones um, are, are perhaps um, hidden or invisible. Um, and I'd love to hear about some ways that you folks are already diversifying and contextualizing knowledge. It seems like from the chat we've had so far, um, people are being really creative about um, how to get students to think more creatively themselves about knowledge. Um, and also, I'd be curious to hear, do you talk about collective learning in your classroom? So even if you don't use that exact phrase, do you explore in your classroom how human knowledge changes and grows over time and the different contexts um, that you talk about collective knowledge? Um, I know for, for me as a student, I talked, I heard a lot about democracy across time. So I'd be curious if something like that shows up. Um, so these questions are going to put, be put here. And I'll also, um, Megan, could you possibly put them in the chat as well? Um, if, if since the screen might not be available. Um, but what I'd like us to do is to take a 10 minute breakout room. Um, so we'll have smaller groups so that it's easier to turn your mic on and turn on your camera and chat. And I'd love you all to talk about your own classrooms. And then we'll come back together and share a little bit from, from each group. Um, so let's come back at uh, 10 to and um, you will be put into breakout rooms shortly. This meeting is being recorded. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, it would be great to maybe have one person from each breakout room um, jump in and give us some highlights um for any of these questions um so we'll go through each question and and maybe you can have um either in the chat or the raised hand function um if you don't see anyone else from your group volunteering please do um pop something in the chat so that we can get a little bit of a taste um, of every single conversation that you all have um so the first question uh what giants do students know about and and we can also say what ideas or big ideas um and which ones maybe uh would you like to incorporate a little bit more but they don't really know um yeah feel free to use the raised hand function or the chat feature
Enrique, please go ahead. Okay, so in our group discussion, we shared a couple of resources as far as being able to integrate other other cultures or other giants as far as um, being able to integrate in, in, into lessons when introducing something new, uh, went through and talked about Nusella having offbeat informational text that has those 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 hidden giants um, to, to what's going on. And there was another member that shared um, Stanford History Education Group as far as a resource. Um, we did put those links into the chat um, as far as what to work for them and, 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 and being able to um, just communicate and, and have students learn um, the other side of, of, of history of the under, uh, underrepresented, underrepresented groups. Um, and, and I also have the the unique position where um, I run the Native American department and social studies department. So looking at our quote unquote history books, there's not a lot of representation as far as positive aspects of what Native Americans did. And I'm able to, to bring those in and in building these uh, curriculum maps, um, pacing guides that we're doing for next year, um, being able to plot more of those resources. So we have our Native students that can you know look at a, a certain invention or technique or whatever it might be and say hey my people did that they contributed to what the americas and societies turned into today thank you so much enrique that's such a, an important point you know um, for students to have first of all the ability to see people like themselves but also to give credit to for example um, indigenous communities for a lot of the ideas and contributions they made um, and giving people access to resources um, that, that that's tough. I mean, um, it's fine. It's hard to find resources. So we can also build our collective learning as a group um, to share that. Um, both uh, Tim and Scott pointed out that there are um, sort of this, there's this tendency for students to know the presidents, the founding fathers, they may not know equally important figures like Frederick Douglass um, and Frank, um, or even where those founding fathers and presidents got their ideas. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, Lori, feel free to jump in. Sorry, I took off the camera, sorry about that. Um, so one of the things that I've noticed because they did the switch from the old standards to the new standards in the last couple of years, um, that kids really didn't have a knowledge of like Copernicus, Kepler, all of the, the older scientific um, revolutionary um, leaders, but they had some sort of knowledge about the discoveries that they made through exposure through pop culture, exposure through um, strangely enough cartoons or different pieces. Um, they knew a lot about Einstein, but not a lot about um, all of the different pieces that he contributed. Um, so it's kind of interesting how much kids actually, when you actually start looking and digging into um, the actual concepts that those people um, developed through partnerships and through building on the shoulders of each other. Um, when the kids are like, oh, that's what, who figured that out. And that they kind of actually start, it's amazing to see how much they actually know when they didn't really know that they knew it. And then you start kind of building from there. Um, but it was it was also really interesting to see um, that they might know George Washington, they might know Lincoln and the more famous presidents. But again, I think someone mentioned in the chat, they don't know the Frederick Douglasses and the, the, the people who might not be as well known that might be more um, um, not as focused on in, in our history curriculum. So I think it's really important for us to make sure that we're not just teaching um, the big, more popular, more, um, more, um, trying to search for a word, the, the foundational people, but as well as those people who continue to contribute over time to see how those ideas morphed and changed as social norms changed through history. Yeah, thank you so much, Lori. And, and, and that's such a good point that students often know what maybe like one point in a story, but they're missing some of the connecting pieces or they have a stereotype about a particular person and what they contributed and they miss out on a whole other things that they've done. Um, and, you know, uh, you know, thank you, Mercedes, for pointing out and the OER project has um, resources. One of the things we try to do is 
um, create little moments for students to, to glimpse a bigger picture. Um, and, but we also try to focus on individuals where we can. So we, we want students to be able to think across skills. And um, we've developed a series of biographies where students can just have a look at one person and, and um, what they've contributed. And sometimes it's a story of knowledge. Sometimes it's a slightly different story. Um, I love the idea of focusing on the idea of language. Language is an important technology and it's something we take for granted, but we all come up with different kinds of language. Um, Scott points out pop culture does impact student knowledge. Um, and it's actually interesting to even use uh, pop culture as a place to start sometimes um, or to think through um, our received ideas. Um, Naomi uh, points out that, you know, there, sorry, there, there were quite a few middle school social studies teachers who said that their students knew very few giants. Um, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, perhaps as the students get older, they start recognizing more individual people. Um, and I think, you know, students do learn a lot from social media and pop culture, as, as Scott and Naomi point out. Um, Students are learning through TikTok and YouTube videos, and those can be a really useful resource, but it's a it's something that also needs to be deepened and challenged sometimes in the classroom. Um, as you know, as you know, you can get you know great things from there, but you can also be misled. And um, I think the work of like deepening something really does take a bit longer sometimes than um, sort of the, the factoids that students can come across, but it can really spark their interest. Um, and these can also be modes of communicating. So I know students who, oh, like, like Scott pointed out, like teachers changing lyrics to songs. Um, often students get to make their own music videos or flip books or TikToks to explain their, um, their understanding of a topic. And that's a really fun way to get them engaged. So, oh, Mr. Nikki, I have not checked that out, but I will go look for those. Thank you for sharing. Um, all right, the next one, what are some ways you already diversify and contextualize knowledge? And let's kind of link that up to, do you talk about collective learning in your classroom? Um, so Shoni says that um, in their group, they talked about etymology. So the history of how terms and ideas change. Um, that's a really fantastic one um, because you can just take one word and really trace it back. Um, but you talked about how having these kinds of conversations takes a lot of time and that's challenging. Absolutely. Um, what I often recommend is to pick one idea that you can keep exploring throughout units so that, you know, to diversify and contextualize does not always mean to um, have a, a ton of different options, but sometimes just one powerful idea. Um, that's one of the reasons I love collective learning. It can kind of be a lens to look at things you're already studying and think about, well, what collective learning is happening in this unit? Um, but I agree, it's it's not only hard to incorporate into the classroom, but the, the resources are limited. And, and at the OER project, we are working on this, but um, this is something that teachers often take a lot of time to research and figure out how to integrate. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely a challenge. And I'd love to talk more later in this. Um, we have a little conversation about some of these challenges. So I'd love you to, um, chime in then as well, Shoni, about um, the challenges that you all talked about. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to share about number two or three uh, in the chat or go ahead and raise your hand? Really love that etymolo etymology idea. Um, the history of a word can be a really cool way to trace an idea and how it emerged. Um, so even something like what is democracy? And then chase, tracing that back. Um, I took a graduate course on the idea of nature. And it was really exciting to see people from different backgrounds bring in different conceptions of nature and what nature means in their culture and what the word means in their language. Um, that was really um, a fantastic conversation uh, and, and can link up to certain curriculums. Um, Lori, do you have your hand raised or? Um... Oh, no, I did. Um... One of the things that I do to really diversify what I'm doing is I, I'm teaching, I go between seventh and eighth grade, which also makes it hard because, you know, every year I have to bounce back and forth. But um, last year, I really worked to diversify the, the government curriculum, and make sure that as we're going through the governmental process and we're looking at potential laws that students disagree with, the civil rights, um, things that were coming out of um, Black Lives Matter, um, the civil rights movement was a huge piece of our curriculum and looking at like starting back from Jim Crow laws um, through the black codes and looking at what was going on in society at the time and how those ideas morphed 
And I think it really kind of helped kids figure out like where the root of some of those ideas were. So they were better able to um, grasp how to, or what was effective and ineffective in changing things to give them the context of, um, is a protest going to be the thing that's going to get the movement? What else do you have to pair with it? How, how can you take the successes and the failures of people in the past and see what's going on um, socially in the present to, to kind of really get an understanding of what the issue is and how to best attack it? Um, and I thought that the kids really kind of benefited from that and bringing in those, those older concepts from the civil rights era and um, the period between the Civil War and um, the civil rights era was really able to help understand better the Black Lives Matter movement and the current, the current status of where we are in America with how we talk to each other and where um, different um, biases come from. It really helps them actually kind of open up to, to that. So that was kind of interesting because I'm a very white teacher teaching in a very Hispanic school. So that really also helped us bridge that cultural gap of them considering me, oh, you're just that white lady talking in front of me, you don't know. Um, it really kind of helps them like us make that connection that we're building it together and that we're kind of figuring out where we fit into that that um, paradigm shift. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Lori. I love the idea of exploring um, different ideas in the context of something like the civil rights movement. So even if we think about the idea of protest as a technique, you know, where did that come from? And what are different ways that people thought about protesting or, or even the idea of rights, right? Um, we can think about civil rights, we can think about natural rights, we can think about rights as we understand them today. Um, different religious traditions have notions of rights. Um, you know, there were feudal rights. So um, it's a really great way. And what I love about the story of knowledge is that it's a bit of an accordion. You can kind of make it smaller or make it bigger depending on how much time you have on the unit you're in. So you don't need to explore every different kind of right. You might want to explore what did rights mean in this moment or what did protest mean in this moment? Um, but then you can also figure out ways to extend it, go back further in time or connect it to the present as you said, Lori. Um, and so that's one way uh, to really include a story of knowledge in um, a, a unit that most of us have to teach at some point, um, something like civil rights. Um, but also, you know, sometimes people can think about, well, what, where did the idea of race come from? Or where did the idea of um, uh, different social classes working together come from? Um, I remember in a civics class, you know, some of my students wrote about the history of a union and where that came from. Um, and I think that also helps manage some of the um, difficulty with current events because when you can look at an idea and where it came from and how it's changed, that's not always the same thing as having to agree or disagree with it, um, but as a way of really trying to understand the context. And that helps students shift perspectives a little bit away from, um, you know, just a very shallow understanding of what was going on um, Scott points out that, you know, understanding the idea of racism and rights for all people and how that changed um, and which people they're talking about and why. That's a really good point because um, when people talk about rights, uh, they had different meanings. And so, you know, talking about the Constitution is a really great way to talk about why rights, you know, were being spoken about in a very different way than we understand them now, and to try to trace at what point that changed and why even then was the idea of rights revolutionary in a certain way. Um, so that's really fantastic. Thank you all for sharing. Um, and then lastly, collective learning. Um, we touched on it a little bit, but if anyone wants to jump in with any other points about collective learning in your classroom, um, please do uh, let us know, you know where, where this comes up. A few of you earlier on mentioned sort of the idea of community knowledge and being proud of a community. Um, and we can look at that from the community of your school, to your city, to your state, to a broader um, social group or culture, um, which can be a really cool way to get students excited about collective learning. Betsy points out that in seventh grade, they talk about why revolutions occur. Yeah, revolutions is a great one too. I mean, where, you know, revolutions can be kind of contagious. Why is it that whether you're talking about Atlantic revolutions 200 years ago, or even now people talk about things like the Arab Spring, what makes an idea like a protest or a revolution or a democracy take off? And how does it become 
kind of kind of contagious. Um, that's a really cool one. I really like that. And that contributes to collective learning. Why, why at some point in, in history did the idea of sovereignty, popular sovereignty, become a tipping point? And our collective learning about what humans should have as basic rights, why did that change? Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. So now that we've really fleshed out all of these different ways we might expand our story of knowledge, I really want to um, dive in a little bit to the case study that we have here. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this is a particular uh, context, Islamic scholars of the medieval period. And this may not fit in your classroom or what you teach, um, but I hope that by talking through it, you can get an idea of why this case study can help you select materials that are appropriate to your classroom. Um, so I want to talk about the three-pronged approach that I highlighted a little bit earlier, a little bit more deeply and connected to um, these case studies. Um, so the first article we read was the introductory article of six-part series on Islamic scholars. And these serve as a case study for a few different reasons. And, and we designed these um, articles with this in mind. First, um, they, they diversify and contextualize because they represent scholars from the medieval Islamic world, which is not a historical context that is covered in most uh, American curriculums. And they also contextualize the scholarship by talking about what exactly was happening in those societies that became the condition for this new knowledge. Um, and it really shows you that Islamic, um, the Islamic society was really diverse. You know, it wasn't one place, one language, one group of people. Um, they also focus on collecting a collective learning because they highlight how social and collaborative and collective knowledge making was and still is. Um, even though these focus on individual scholars, um, they really flesh out the context around them. And they're also helpful for evaluating narratives. Um, they push the students to be critical about the stories they've heard about who makes knowledge. Plus, the, the arguments, the articles themselves are making arguments. You know, one thing at the OER project that we really value is that we don't like to give students a voice from nowhere, you know, a textbook that they just have to trust and, and we don't know who wrote it or how they wrote it or what sources they used. Um, this is written by myself and three other authors. Each author has their own voice. Um, and in addition to the people who write it, we also have the artists who are putting forth their own interpretation. So we'll talk about that a little bit, but it gives students an opportunity to um, even evaluate the arguments we're making. And so across the series, and this is these are the six articles in the series, including the first one, which you've read, um, there's a diversity of, of, free, of, of viewpoints. So there are common themes and contexts. So the invisible giant theme, um, collective learning theme is threaded across them. The artists who illustrated the articles are consistent across the articles. So we have two artists who illustrated each of these. Um, and this gives them a unified look and feel. But the written portions are different. Um, so they were written by myself, as well as Bennett Sherry, Bridget O'Connor, and Trevor Getz. And each author and illustrator puts forth a narrative about how knowledge was made. And that invites students to um, respond to that narrative. So before we read and discuss the articles, which we'll do in breakout rooms, I want to touch on how these articles connect to this approach. And then we'll unpack specific articles um, in each group and parse out some places where they do or don't demonstrate the approach in action. And because this is a case study, you know, there are some things that does well and there are limitations and we would like to talk about those as well. Um, so the first aspect of this is diversifying and contextualizing. So across these articles, we're looking at lesser known scholars, at least lesser known to students in North America, Europe and Australia. But one thing that's really interesting is they're often very well known elsewhere. Um, and I discovered this when we were researching these because I went down a bit of a rabbit hole looking at stamp collections. And I found that there are so many postage stamps made that claim these scholars. So whether you're in Russia or Iran or Syria or Algeria or Uzbekistan, there are postage stamps like national postage stamps where people are claiming these scholars as part of their heritage. So they may not be giants in in American classrooms, but they are giants for someone. And that's also important for students to see. Um, so although these people may seem unfamiliar, uh, one of the ways we try to make them rela relatable for students is we tether them to topics that students will have already learned about. So topics like astronomy, navigation of the oceans, algebra. So you might find that you know in your classroom it doesn't make sense to feature all of these, but maybe in a unit on um, you know uh, oceanic navigation, um, the, the line of the sea article makes sense, 
or maybe in a class where you're talking about, um, for example, uh, chemistry or alchemy, uh, that makes sense, or algebra might make sense somewhere. So in addition to showing that these scholars are diverse, we want to show that knowledge itself is diverse. It's not singular. Um, we have so many different ways to think about something like chemistry or mathematics. Um, and it also helps that these are contextualized because they focus on technologies. Um, and I like the word technology very broadly. As I said, something like language is a technology. Something like the food that a culture eats is a technology. It's a device, it's a tool that helps you adapt to your needs. Um, and so when you focus on technologies, you necessarily have to focus on context because you have to think about what were the materials that were available? What were the techniques that people had? What were the political circumstances that required these particular um, adaptations? And these all played a role in the discovery and innovation. So this is all to say, these help us see that ideas are not in a person's head. They are in a society with particular conditions, just like our society is now. People come up with technologies and ideas for specific needs, which bring us to our next point, which is collective learning. Um, these articles do talk about geniuses. You know, it's not as though these don't feature individuals. They certainly do. And a lot of these geniuses create entirely new paradigms, new ways of thinking about the world. But it also really wants to highlight that they did not do this alone. Um, collective learning spans time and space. And in these articles, we really want to show how collaboration, exchange, teaching, borrowing, explanation, and synthesis are important processes that connect different thinkers into a network. And this is even if those thinkers never met each other. And in many of these articles, they are across centuries and continents. Um, so the story of knowledge is more personal. It shows the ups and downs that different scholars experienced. You know, some of them were on the good side or the bad side of the, the emperors. Some of them um, had funding for their research. Some of them didn't. Um, and it also shows that there were particular circumstances that either made it possible for them to do their work or made it impossible. So we're trying to take the story of knowledge beyond the Eureka moment, beyond the aha moment, and show that Hey, knowledge builds over time, but it's also messy. It comes in fits and starts. Things get lost, they get rediscovered, they get put to new use by different people. Um, and so the focus on collective learning really works in tandem with the first objective. So, you know, we give context, we fill out this map of knowledge making, we make it more diverse and we zoom in and out. Um, and we populate it with a whole bunch of people that you wouldn't normally imagine. And the effect of focusing on collective learning and context is funny because it opens up the imagination, but it does that by making knowledge more real. And it shows how knowledge making works in a little bit more realistic manner. So then students are freer to imagine themselves. So um, it, by making it grounded, by showing us the particular places where knowledge is made, it helps students see themselves as potential knowledge makers. Um, this lowers the stakes, right? They don't have to be the low, lone genius. Um, it opens it up to many different kinds of people, like yourselves, like educators, like librarians, like writers, like people who work in laboratories, people who work in um, making telescopes, uh, making math textbooks, and it makes it imaginable and attainable for all of us, not just our students. Um, and that brings us to the third prong, which is evaluating narratives. And this one we'll focus on a bit more in our session tomorrow. But what's important to see here is that when we reorient our thinking, when we start thinking about diversifying and contextualizing, when we start thinking about collective learning, this naturally brings us to the final objective, which is that we need to critically evaluate narratives. Um, these articles try to model how to think about context, how to pay attention to things like how knowledge is exchanged socially, or how to ask questions about who or who isn't in a story, who isn't present. Um, so students then get invited to, the, to do the same. One of the ways we like to set this up is that students can evaluate the narratives the authors and the illustrators are putting forth. So as you can see in the beautiful um, illustrations that our artist Katie Hasib has done on the right side of this page, she's making an argument about something here and getting students to think about that can be a fun way for them to think about arguments um, outside of just written ones and also to think about the relationship between the argument or the narrative that's in the images, which are not just by um, Katie, but as well by Peter, our other artist, 
and relate them to the um, artists, I mean, the authors of the article. So you have three different narratives happening in each of these. And as teachers, you can kind of choose which one makes the most sense for your classroom to focus on. Um, but they get to ask questions like, do they agree that Copernicus stood on L2C's shoulders? Um, which is the story that the header of the first image tells, um, or do the author's claims hold up? Um, and then they can also answer, ask their own questions about where ideas or inventions or discoveries come from. And then hopefully they can go looking themselves. And, um, you know, history of science, which is my, my main field, one of the reasons I love uh, the history of science is that um, it's really a very young field. The history of science is really, you know, in the last maybe 70 years, but it's maybe in the last 40 or 50 years that it's really taken off. And because it's a young field, it's actually really easy for people to get involved in it. Almost everything in your house, in your car, in your city um, is a place to jump into that story. And hopefully we invite students to do so. Um, so to summarize, by diversifying and contextualizing history and emphasizing collective learning, um, we naturally move to critically engaging narratives and maybe coming up with our own. And one of the reasons these articles do that is because they give students a way into the history of science and knowledge. Um, and so, you know, as, as Scott points out, like this, the images can help students find a different way in if um, they struggle with uh, English language learning or if they're younger, um, and it really does help them visualize the concept or the person, you know, we're all very different kinds of learners and I think the art helps students bring these stories to life a little bit more um, and to kind of get their imagination going. So now that we have talked about this approach in some detail, I'd like to use it in the back of our minds to analyze these articles and practice noticing these aspects. So we'll ask the same questions we did with the first article, um, but now you know a little bit more about it. So we'll be put into breakout rooms with a number and the number corresponds to the article or group that your, um, the, the article that your group will read and discuss. Um, since we already discussed the first article, there will only be five groups. Uh, one of them is is for the Moraga School, which is not about a specific person, but builds on the first article to talk about um, Nasr al-Din ibn Tusi and other scholars. And then the remaining four focus on specific individuals whose names are in the titles. Um, one thing I would recommend in your groups, if you'd like, is you can listen to the audio um, either together or separately. Um, and that helps with some of the pronunciation. And one of the reasons we uh, really wanted to um, have the articles, these articles read is because we know that sometimes difficult word names um, that are not familiar to students can trip them up and teachers as well. Um, you know, these are not names that most people know how to pronounce. So that's one way to help also for not just English language learners, but all of us. Um, so just to reiterate the questions, um, we have the same questions as before. We'll put them in the chat. Um, and we'll let you know in each breakout room which one you'll be discussing. Um, I can go back to the previous slide if, if you like. Um, but the questions we'll be discussing are, how does this article diversify and contextualize narratives about knowledge? So the first prong, um, where is the diversification? Where is the contextualization? Second question is collective learning. Do you find it in this article? Where do you find it? It might be named directly, it might not be. Um, and then the last one is, what is the what are the narratives going on here? Um, what's the author's narrative? Maybe the illustrator's narratives, and what are some opportunities there for students to jump in and um, respond, agree, disagree? Um, where are they invited into the narrative? Um, so these are the three questions I'd like us to answer, and you'll each focus on just one of them. Um, so Megan, thank you so much for posting the links again, um, and I will go back to. Um, this slide once we're in the breakout room so you know which one you're discussing right at the beginning. Um, and then I'll go back to the questions so that you all can see them. Um, do we have any questions before we uh, start? All right, so we'll take a little bit of extra time in this breakout room. Um, oh, Rainy, go ahead. I couldn't figure out how to find the audio version. Can you tell me how to do that? Oh, sure. Let me screen share that and show you. Um, uh, 
All right, uh, one moment, please. All right, so this is the um, link that is in the chat. So if you were to click on this first one and open up that article, up here at the right side, you can play the audio version. Um, and you likely can't hear it on my computer. However, if you screen share and share audio, so if, if anyone in the group wants to share it so you can listen to it together, I believe we've enabled um, screen sharing, you can listen to it at the same time, or you can all just go on mute and listen to it or read it separately. Um, and um, there are also levels. So uh, this is for students of different ages. A lot of our articles um, at the OER project are leveled. Um, so this is also useful. Um, both for teachers and for students to just look at different versions of the article. You do miss out on a little bit of the information at the lowest level, but it is useful for, um, for you to check those out. Um, so this is sort of the interface for the, for the articles. And I will share my... ...thing is being recorded. All right, welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed uh, the articles and I'm excited to discuss them with you all. Um, so in the last few minutes, I'd like to um, get your ideas on these articles. And since folks all read different articles, it would be great to share um, a little bit about the article that you read so that other folks who didn't read it can have a little bit of a taste of it. Um, and then we'll wrap up by talking a little bit more about bringing this back to your classroom and uh, just chatting a little bit about what we'll do tomorrow. Um, so let's start with uh, question one, diversification and contextualization of stories of knowledge. Um, let's try to get one volunteer from each uh, group. Um, again, feel free to raise your hand or use the chat function, um, but let us know what in your particular article um, how did we learn about knowledge in a more diverse and contextualized manner? So let's start with um, the first article, the Moraga School. Um, who has, who read that one? Let's go in order so that we can not skip any. Dana, was that your article or do you, are you in another group? Nope, that was our article. <laughs> All right, please jump in, thank you. Okay, no problem. Um, so the, the basic rundown of the article uh, was looking at that time period between the more commonly uh, taught, you know, Ptolemy and Calpurnius and how, you know, even though there was like a 1400 year span between them and those things, uh, what was happening between that time? How was this knowledge being developed? and um, you know, those kind of things. And it was talking about those uh, influencers uh, that came from India, Chinese, Babylon, Persia, Arab, you know, those, those people that were all thinking of it. And it's looking, it was looking at our geocentric and our heliocentric uh, model of our, our particular solar system. Um, and so for one, how does the article diversify contextual narratives? Um, it does give those influencers and what they were doing during that time, um, the uh, Maraga, did I say that correctly? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but Maraga, I think is how Maraga. I Maraga, thank you. Yes, they created uh, in, um, during the Mongolian, uh, you know, ruler, uh, they created an, a, an observatory. And so they spent this time, you know, pursuing this knowledge and developing these concepts. Uh, they kept more of the 
uh, geocentric type uh, of our solar system. Um, and then, you know, talking about, it was just basically the missing time frame, you know, what had happened. And also it gave a really good example of uh, how, you know, different people were doing a comparative of it. You know, some people think that these influencers like Altusi and Al Shatar influenced it. And then there's how other scientists are like, yeah, it's not really that influenced. Um, so I thought that was really good. And then how does the article illustrate the concept of collective learning? Um, for me, it definitely demonstrated the diversification that these thoughts were going all around the world for everybody. Um, the only thing that I kind of felt it needed um, was how was how was it spread? You know, if if these guys in this part of the country were thinking of it, maybe just a mention of using the trade routes, you know, this knowledge was spread throughout, you know, how did the Europeans actually get this knowledge from over here on this side of the planet, um, you know, to get this stuff spread around. Um, so that was just kind of like maybe just a criticism, you know, not not in a bad way, because it was great. But just, you know, just I, I wanted to know, well, how did they get that? All right. Um, and then the opportunities, uh, does it create uh, evaluating narratives of knowledge and how does, uh, absolutely, it does. Uh, evaluating narratives about knowledge, it really, uh, it, I think it influences, it gives us a broader spectrum and it fills in that blank that, you know, because you know these two guys are really far apart. Well, did it just stop? This guy thought of it and then that guy later thought of it, you know. So it really does fill in that blank that there were more people on our planet thinking about these concepts and developing this knowledge and also the math that is necessary uh, to do it. So that's my thought. Thank you so much, Dana. And, and, I, and I love that you are also evaluating the narrative. You're, you're jumping in and asking questions yourself about, well, how did this information get spread across? How did it go from point A to point B? And so you're modeling exactly what we want students to do um, and to say, well, you know, this author gives us a story, but I'm, I'm not sure about this particular gap. Um, it gives them a way to interact with it. So thank you so much, Dana, for taking us through this. And I like how you connected these three questions. So um, unless someone else from group one wants to add anything, um, perhaps we can jump to group two. Well, I guess I will try this. I'm on my phone, so it's a little difficult. So our article discussed um, pure metal, and it was about an Arabic alchemist um, that actually um, was trying to figure out how to create gold. So he was um, classifying the properties of metal, and that led him to a large number of just scientific discoveries um, he was using processes like distillation, filtration, amalgamation, um, and a lot of his teachings, um, he, I think he wrote over 3,000 texts that were translated to multiple languages, and his teachings actually spurred the thinking of Sir Isaac Newton and others um, long after he had written them, so that's kind of the gist of it, um, I think. Did I, get, did I capture the gist? Okay. So we were talking about the diversification and contextualization, contextualization um, about knowledge within this. And it kind of really lent itself because people really think of Sir Isaac Newton and Copernicus and um, new, all of these people as the, the founders of the scientific revolution where um, he actually, this, this man's thinking actually spurred other people's thinking. So it kind of um, put it into, into perspective that some, a lot of the ideas in science aren't something that someone truly comes up with individually by themselves, but they do build on other people's knowledge in even across cultures and across time periods. So it really helps us see that these ideas connect through multiple cultures, multiple time periods, multiple lines of, of thinking. Um, and it kind of, I think it also puts a face on science that it's not just these big greats that do it. It's, it's people who are lesser known who have made just as important and critical discoveries. Um, and I think it can put a face on that for some of our kids that, um, that are so disconnected from it to see people 
people, maybe from their own cultures that are able to have um, be credited with attributing to um, some of these greater levels of thinking. Um, and it also talked about collective learning. Um, this man influenced um, his teachings and learnings influence other people. And I think one of the cool things we had talked about, somebody in the group had mentioned that um, it really kind of shows like in science, you go in and you might have a hypothesis. You might think you're going to get a certain result, but that re result might not happen. And it's going to spur, you know, something completely different. He was trying to create gold, but instead of creating gold, he ended up finding all these different scientific pieces and that's not what he set out to do, but that spurred thinking and it's kind of cyclic. It just keeps spurring more and more um, new learning. So people might go into things thinking that they're going to get a certain result or looking for a result. Um, and it kind of spurs other people to continue thinking and it actually kind of popcorns lots of new learnings off of it. So um, it really is a collective piece of learning. Um, and then evaluating narratives about knowledge. I think one of the things that I really like about this is, I guess it was a failure that they didn't figure out how to make gold because you can't make gold like that. But it also can let our kids know that even these great scientists experience failures that spur great greatness. So some of our kids can get very down on themselves if they don't get things right away. And I think this actually can help um, going back to the contextualiza contextualizing piece to know that every failure is not necessarily a failure, it's a fail forward. Um, and I think that that's really important to know about the narrative um, where we are, um, we're continually creating knowledge. And even if we're failing, we're failing forward and that we are going to like the, the ideas are not going to be coming from one area or another area. They're connecting across, across globally, I think is important. And I'm just babbling now. So I'm going to shut up and somebody else can talk. No, you are not babbling, Lori. That was very helpful and very useful. So thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, these give us opportunities to really think about how students are um, experiencing these stories and how many ways they can experience it differently. And I mean, with this article, Pure Metal, what's really cool that, that Trevor Getz, the author does, is point out, and the artists interpret it as well, is that we don't even really know if he was even just one person. Um, so it, it's really exciting. Um, we are short on time, but for those of you who are joining us tomorrow, we will pick up where we left off. Uh, but just to kind of briefly sum up for today, um, and we'll talk about the other articles tomorrow. Uh, we'll also talk about the different ways that in your classroom, you might be able to implement these, but also the limitations there are to this approach. Um, and limitations, I think of as a good invitation to do more and to do better. And, you know, even like Scott pointed out in the chat that some of these articles could incorporate like Mayan and Incan perspectives, for example. And, you know, these are, as I said, a case study focused on one particular slice of, you know, science, history of science. And there are so many other directions to go in. And we can talk a bit more about that tomorrow. And we can talk about this here, but this is sort of random technologies that pop up in your classroom, whether it's like language or writing or the idea of evolution or the idea of making a map or titrating a chemical or doing computation or having a parliament. And so knowledge is everywhere. And I'd love to talk a bit more tomorrow about that. So what we'll do tomorrow is uh, we'll do the story of knowledge part two. And here we'll do a really deep dive on how to build these skills in the classroom. Um, and we'll focus on an investigation called how and why do individuals change their minds. So we'll talk about things like the geocentric view, how planets um, move, um, you know, these different thinkers like Galileo and Kepler. And what we'll use this investigation to do is to think about critical reading and writing, both of primary and secondary texts um, and thinking about the different claims and arguments and narratives embedded in those. So we'll, we'll wrap up some of the discussion from today that we didn't get to um, and transition into this investigation, which we'll work on tomorrow. Um, and um, we can talk a little bit about how these articles connect to one another. Um, check out our website in the meantime, if, if you'd like. Um, and if you need to reach me before tomorrow, here's my email address, feel free to reach out. I'm really grateful for your time today and I hope to see you all tomorrow um, to continue the conversation and to deepen it um, and talk about some specific activities we can do in our classrooms uh, to trace how ideas transform over time and how people change their minds about um, particular concepts or particular understandings of the world. Um, which can apply in many fields, whether it's natural sciences, um, as these as this case study explores, or political science. 
Um, so once again, thank you all so much for joining me here today. I'm really grateful for your time and for your contributions and for the collective learning we're working on together. Um, and I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.